The Heinen gibbon is the world's rarest primate species and one of the world's rarest mammals, with only a single population of about 30 individuals remaining. Can advances in machine learning, more specifically deep neural networks, help in automatically recognize the gibbon cause and essentially assist in creating robust passive acoustic monitoring frameworks? My name is Emmanuel Dufour. I'm a postdoc researcher at the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences and Stellenbosch University. This study was a joint collaboration with a number of researchers around the world. The title of this talk is Automated Detection of the Heinen Gibbon Cause for Passive Acoustic Monitoring. I'm Sam Turvey. I'm a researcher at the Institute of Zoology, which is part of the Zoological Society of London, and I've been involved for about a decade on a long-term conservation programme for the Heinen Gibbon. The Hainan gibbon is one of the world's rarest mammals and it's the world's rarest ape. Um, it was originally found across pretty much all of Hainan Island, which is China's southernmost province. Um, up to the 1950s or so, there were still several thousand gibbons found across the island, which was then well forested. But the species experienced a precipitous decline in the second half of the 20th century due to a combination of deforestation and uh, hunting for food and traditional medicine. And by the end of the 20th century, there was only a single gibbon population left within a single protected area, Baoangling National Nature Reserve in Western Hainan. So it's really important, given the perilous conservation state of this species, to have really effective monitoring in order to understand the, the status of the population, if that population experiences any changes or declines or any unexpected dynamics. To, so we know that um, if any changes in conservation management are required. Traditionally, the way that the Hainan gibbon and other gibbon species have been monitored is by using acoustic monitoring, whereby teams of people in the forest will listen out for gibbons singing and then will locate the gibbons based on their song in the early mornings. Um, which is very, it's effective, but it's very labour intensive. It's been recognised as a conservation priority to see if there's any other ways that can be used to monitor gibbons um, using different novel technologies, in particular using um, passive acoustic, acoustic recording. So by placing acoustic recording devices within the forests of Hainan to see whether you can um, detect gibbon calls. The gibbons call pretty much every day if they're in a social group and it's partly to um, strengthen the pair bonds and the social bonds within the group but also to display to other gibbon groups in the landscape um, that they're there and it's their patch. There's only a few groups of gibbons left within Baoangling, but they still call regularly. In 2016, we trialled uh, a pilot study, I say pilot study, it's for six months, so it's quite a long pilot, between March and August of that year, in which we had eight song meters uh, placed within and around the geographic ranges of the four social groups of gibbons that were then present within the reserve. Hi everyone, I'm Heidi. I am the project coordinator for the Hainan Gibbon Project at the Zoological Society of London. Um, and most of my job involves coordinating research, uh, which includes collecting data for projects like this, and also um, working with local governments, local researchers, um, and other NGOs, both uh, in China and internationally. So how we collected the data uh, for this project um, is, first of all, we got a grant from Wildlife Acoustics, um, and we obtained eight uh, song meters, uh, which are acoustic recorders, um, passive acoustic recorders that we then took to China. Um, but first of all, we had to set the program um, uh, in, in the machines for them to record the given calls when they call, which is very early in the morning. Um, another additional challenge was that uh, the manuals um, from the song meters and the, the programs, the devices themselves, uh, are only in English, so we had to translate uh, the, the manual um, and our specific uh, recording program um, into Chinese um, for the rangers in Baoling Reserve to be able to use. In total, we deployed eight machines. Uh, four were placed in the home ranges of four of the gibbon groups uh, that were known at the time, and four other machines 
were placed in between groups to try to capture between these groups. I'm Jessica Bryant and I'm now based at Roehampton University, but I did my PhD and a further three years of postdoctoral research on the Heinen Gibbon during my time at ZSL. And during my time, uh, during my postdoctoral work, I thought, well, we're using Gibbon songs to locate and track and understand population size for the Hainan Gibbon. Is there a way that we can do this in a more automated fashion to help reduce the number of hours and the, the, the physical field effort that the field team uh, of Bowling National and Nature Reserve have to use to try and monitor the Hainan Gibbon? So it was my job or my role within the project to design and implement the field strategy, so the data collection strategy, and I was also I also led the field team in the deployment of the song meters out in Bowingling. I'm Christina Stander and I work at Cell London Zoo and I have been for nearly eight years now. I volunteered my time at the Institute at Cell, uh, which is where I got introduced to the uh, project of automated detection of Hainan Gibbon calls as well. My role basically was to detect any Gibbon calls that were collected from the data. I used the Audacity software program, which is where not only could I hear them call in, but I could also see it. So the line here is an actual Gibbon call. Once I had located um, the call itself, I would then type it into a spreadsheet where I would label uh, the file, I would label the start time of the call and what time it finished, and within that period how many calls I would hear, um, and also if there's any other sounds besides gibbons, uh, like birds or insects or heavy rain for instance, I would also put that in there. After labeling our audio files, we had roughly 5,000 examples of given and non-given calls. We applied data augmentation so that each audio file in our dataset could yield 10 new examples. On each audio file containing a given call, we randomly selected 10 audio files which did not contain a call. We then randomly shifted the non-given calls by a few seconds and blended that in with the original given call. This essentially allowed us to create new synthetic calls with varying background conditions. After using this augmentation approach, we obtained roughly 19,000 audio examples for which 60% of that was used to train the model and the remaining 40% for evaluation. To train the neural network, we had to create a data set of given and non-given calls. We thus had to extract audio segments from the files and we needed to decide on the duration of these segments as the neural network requires a fixed input size. Initially we tried a small input of only two seconds and the performance of the neural network was not very good. We then studied the average duration of the calls in our training data set and we found that the longest call was around seven seconds. We thus decided it would be suitable to extract 10 second segments from the audio files to ensure that the entire call would be represented within that time. We downsampled the audio files to 9600 Hz to help reduce the computational requirements of processing these large files. To enable us to use two-dimensional convolutional neural networks, we had to convert our audio dataset into a spectrogram dataset. To convert the audio dataset into a spectrogram dataset, we had to use a window size of 1024 a hop size of 256 and we used 128 mile frequency bins uniformly placed between 1 to 2 kilohertz. The rationale for this is because the given cores were primarily between 1 to 2 kilohertz. The dataset was now made up of given and non-given cores represented as 128 by 188 spectrogram images. My name is Amanda Hoopner and I'm from the University of Utah. The main issue still persists though, now that we have these thousands and tens of thousand hours of recordings, how do we find these instances that we are actually curious in, these vocal events? Hi, I'm Ian Derbach. I'm an ecological statistician based between the University of St. Andrews and the University of Cape Town. We use two kinds of neural network architectures, a 1D CNN and a 2D CNN. The input for the 1D CNN is a time series of amplitudes for a 10-second segment of audio, so it's a vector of numbers. 
for the 2D CNN, the input is a spectrogram constructed from the same 10 second segments, so it's an image. Although the inputs differ, both models have the same kind of output. It's a predictive probability that the, that the input segments, either the vector of numbers or the image, contains at least one complete given phrase. Because we had relatively little training data by deep learning standards, we used simple network architectures that need relatively few parameters to be estimated. We experimented with between one and three convolutional layers and kept max pooling layers between the convolutional layers to reduce the number of parameters. We found that the best architecture was a 2D CNN with two convolutional layers. We trained each model for 50 epochs and evaluated models based on their test set accuracy, their sensitivity and their specificity. Uh, we set optimal thresholds for converting predicted probabilities into binary classifications of given or no given based on minimizing the ratio of sensitivity and false discovery rates in validation datasets. We applied a post-processing technique as a means of reducing the number of false positives by using our knowledge of the given calls. For example, we know that the calls tend to be repetitive over a short period of time as opposed to just a single call. In this logic, we could convert the network's output into calling bar predictions. In other words, the model could predict the start and end time of a calling bout within an eight-hour file. The dataset is publicly available for download on Zenodo. The audio files are grouped into small chunks for easy download. A user manual is also presented for the Python software notebooks. Python script and software notebooks are publicly available for download on GitHub. A link to a Google Colab notebook is provided. This allows one to easily use the code in a user-friendly way and example files are provided. The training script and predicting script is also provided. The prediction script reads in an audio file and provides the model predictions for the start and end timestamps for which the model thinks contains given calls. When we tasked the model on finding call bouts within 72 hours of testing data, in other words, data that was not used in the training process, the two-dimensional convolution did not miss any bouts. There were two false positive bouts of 52 and 272 seconds. We deployed our software scripts on Amazon AWS using 10 compute instances and were able to process roughly 6,000 hours of data representing 1.4 terabytes in about two days. Further details about our approach and our findings are available in this preprint. The proposed approach is not flawless and will be sensitive to large changes in the environment. Thus, by improving the model by introducing new examples that it may not have encountered before, the model can become more robust and reduce the number of false positives. We hope that the approach we describe in developing this classifier can serve as a roadmap for practitioners to implement their own classifiers for other passive acoustic monitoring projects and can contribute to effective conservation of calling species. Another very important aspect of our work is to improve local conservation capacity. Um, in this case, it meant trialing different technologies um, and different methods um, that were totally new to the rangers in, in Baoling. Um, and it was both challenging, but also very rewarding to work together with them um, to make it as easy and as smoothly uh, as possible for their data collection, um, but also to uh, help us understand better um, the, the needs and uh, the requirements for uh, to collecting this kind of data. With these machine learning techniques that we've used with these givens, it really opens up unlimited possibilities. Now that we can reduce the amount of man hours it takes to actually find the real data, these vocal events that we're interested in, it really enables us to ask a lot more questions. So now if we're interested in one population, we could actually broaden that and look at multiple species and populations of primates in that area to see how they actually relate and how their vocal behaviors overlap or not. Further, if we can more easily find these vocal behaviors that we're interested in these automated recording units, then we can more closely monitor these populations of interest, especially ones as critical as the givens when we have so few individuals left. This will really allow more real-time monitoring and for conservation managers to detect disturbances or any massive changes and respond accordingly. I hope that this talk has been informative and please feel free to reach out if you have any questions or comments.